Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Mauricio Alejo, uh, Alejo as tonight's guest speaker. Originally from Mexico and still living in Mexico, Mauricio attended NYU on a Fulbright scholarship and graduated with a Master of in Arts in 2002. His work has been exhibited at La Habana Bienal, the Trienal Poligrafica de San Juan de Puerto Rico, the Rufino Tamayo Museum in Mexico City, the Museo Nacional Reina Sofia Madrid, and the CCA Juarez Institute in San Francisco. Collections include Daros Latino America Collection in Zurich, Art Museum of the Americas in Washington, D.C., Museo Universitario de Artes y Ciencias MOAC in Mexico City, and the Isabel and Agustin Coppel Collection. Uh, for the past 15 years, through photography and video, Mauricio has been subverting the functionality of everyday objects to arrive at new narratives that are heavy with the feeling of uh, the psychologically uncanny. With a seemingly endless supply of wit and creativity, he turns ordinary spaces into laboratories for aesthetic inquiry. Uh, please help me welcome Mauricio Alejo to our lecture series. I'm here to share with you some secrets, uh, no, da no dark secrets, but I'm going to try to be as candid as possible about my work and, and my career and how, uh, you know, like everything came about and I ended up working here, living here for 13 years and, and showing internationally um, and what exactly uh, it's my passion. So I started uh, as a self-taught photographer and I was dubious of showing this early work, which was the, my first uh, encounter with photography. Um, I was at this moment when I was uh, doing this work, I was enjoying very much just the very fact of doing images, like the way they look. Uh, and what, for example, set, um, made me, you know, like, be passionate and work about uh, and work in photography is because I love just you know how the la the lines the parallel lines uh, are all together and there was for example this other one how these circles just by putting water uh, in the glass the, it becomes this kind of universe of circles and this uh, echoing of circles uh, how the the time you know, that drew these lines on the soap. And objects, objects was something that I, uh, th that really speak to me. And, but not only objects, uh, objects um, through photography, because photography enhanced the experience of what I was having. And I was very lucky, I guess I was lucky at this moment because I, I didn't have a formal education and there was no one na nagging me about like you should do this and or you should do that or that has been done uh, though i was doing things that <laughs> uh, were having you know someone did it before um, but at that time i think i didn't need it and uh, the um, the passion that i was putting in and all the time that i was putting in somehow caught, caught the attention of some critics and some uh, people who love photography and, and that's how my art career started, uh, in a very, uh, so like unintentional way. I was just doing my thing and, and trying to be very honest of, uh, of, uh, about what I was doing. Uh, but at the same time, I had the feeling that, was, that there was something wrong with it. And I couldn't actually tell what it was. Like, I was thinking that, Photography might be something else, like might have something, or there might be something uh, else to it. Uh, and then I start like uh, questioning myself, like I should probably try not to control things that much. Uh, and, and then I moved into this kind of series. Uh, we're talking here like 1997, you know, 1995, 1997. And this was my way to not control things, just find something and put a white background and just let's let the, the object, object speak uh, by itself. And, um, but still, there was, the, it was um, this place where everything was in control. 
and I have the intuition that photography respond, responds better to spontane spontaneity. What is the word? Yeah, like spontaneous. Something that happens and you don't have that much control. So I was kind of like struggling with myself, trying to understand the media. And at this point, I was starting to read about it, about what I was doing, uh, in a way to challenge myself. Um, this is another from that series. And I set up to a new project that, in a way, responded to my questioning and also uh, um, challenged what I was doing. Uh, and, and that came about uh, by asking myself, like, what about photography? What, what is photography? Why I don't go and document people doing their, their thing, or why I don't get uh, involved in history like photography does in a very uh, efficient way? Uh, and while I was asking this to myself, uh, I came up with this other project. And I think it's funny uh, because somehow, if we go back to this, somehow visually responds to respond to what I was doing, which was this kind of um, transparency or, tr or kind of like a, a, a observation of things. And this uh, series, of, series of work, uh, I did it in, um, in the airport. You know these machines where you put your luggage in, you go through customs, so um, I went to the airport and I asked permission. Somehow it caught my, my attention. And I think it caught, caught my, my attention because there was a visual um, uh, background of, of baggage that I have that probably related with modern abstraction, uh, modernist abstraction. And at, but at the same time, it was pertinent, pertinent to photography because this is a densely um, documentary photographs. So what I did is I asked for permission and I went there and I just put my camera, it was a Hasselblad, in front of the monitor. So it, this wasn't even digital, this was 1999. So that, this was before September 11. And, and yeah, like there was not, not, not that much security. And I took uh, in, uh, passengers that were taking international flights. So um, without noticing, I was starting to uh, relate with other features of photography that I didn't relate before. And that actually made me understand photography better. And also made me aware of what was of, about my work that I didn't really like it. What was something that I felt it was like a, I don't know, like a, not that broad or bigger, like, a, like it, was a, it was missing something, that's, that's the word. Uh, and here I think there was a lot of things happening. First, it was uh, questioning reality or our relationship with real images or reality. What is this, uh, what is photography? I mean, what's the relation between reality and the image? Uh, why these images, images are less real so to speak, than the ones we take with a snapshot camera. And um, the other thing is that as a technology, photography has always been used for control, like uh, political control and observation, in a very uh, intense observation. Like the use of photography in, in Paris, the, the first use of photography was to, you know, this, make these files of uh, prostitutes and, and people who, who were uh, criminals. And, and this work, uh, for me, somehow meant uh, to grow up as an artist uh, or grow up as an image make maker. And while, while the other work, the, the first that I was showing, uh, took me to my first uh, uh, international show in PhotoFest in Houston, uh, this was, uh, this, this went beyond that and it was uh, exhibited and published in Europe and, uh, and US and other, other parts in, in Latin America. Somehow by itself it got a more a wider audience and more um, um, critics were more interested in this work. And one thing 
I mean, I love this one. <laughs> you know, this uh, a teddy bear, which is the image of uh, innocence, like all this uh, uh, control uh, technology against it. Um, the um, one thing that I that I uh, st struck me was that uh, one critic said is that this work was somehow inverting the vector of uh, of power. Like now, people who's been observed uh, get the chance to see what it, what you know, like what or how they are being observed, and. And also, it made me understand that context, the art context, can bring a lot of meaning to the work. For example, the um, colors in these um, images um, means um, certain density of the material. So it's meaningful to the people who are seeing the screening because they know if there's something blocking or dangerous or every, any material. The, the meaning is still there. But when you put it in a gallery situation, it kind of like it's a tension there. Like there's something that mean try to mean something, but then it relates with another uh, visual archive we have, and and then start working with it. So uh, that that also added to the complexity of photography and complexity of the images. And what I was enjoying more about this is that I wasn't actually doing this author thing. I was more doing like an operation, like just changing one thing to another place and seeing, seeing what was happening. And I think photography has a lot, a lot to do with that. Like uh, a lot of artists work with our archives that they don't even, you know, they're not their own images and they just recompose the meaning or rework the meaning. And that's, uh, that I think that's one thing that photography uh, brought to, to the art uh, world. Well, not only photography, but it's, uh, it's, a way for the, it's the way that photography works. The problem was that once I did that project and then I will confronted myself, I was really, I had no, nowhere to go. So I was really in a blank uh, because I, I didn't want to be there. I was very interested. I was amused about this new discover, but it, it wasn't the way I wanted to go. I didn't want to be the artist who works with uh, x-rays or machines or, it, just didn't feel like that was my thing. Uh, and, but it visually contradicted so much what I was doing before that I felt I, I just lost the trade. Like, <laughs> so now what? And uh, I stopped doing photography at that moment. And that was when I asked for the Fulbright to come and study here, which made everything even more, more complex. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to be like finding the, the, the way right away. And no, it was quite the opposite. It was very confusing time. Um, and I'm showing this one because this was the first photograph after that project that was probably 2001. And what you're seeing here, it's an uh, acrylic cube that I brought, brought into a snow bed, the first uh, uh, snow, uh, storm that I, that I uh, witnessed it. And I just pull it in and I just, you know, like, did this. And it, it's called Two Cubes in the Snow. And now that I see it ret ret retrospectively, now that I see it now, uh, it means a lot uh, in the new body of work that I start doing. doing. And first, when I put that on the wall, people were, were coming up to the, the image and, and thought it was a drawing. And then they re read the, um, how do you know, the little, the what? The text. Exactly. And they knew it was a photography and they came back to see it. And it's, it's interesting because if you see it as a drawing, there's just a surface. But if you see it as a photograph, then there's something like is there's a space and a time that that happened and i think that's something that always it's a uh, hunting photography and and that's something that gives gives a depth um so three things start working for me first the uh sort of like a fiction of photography and and this gap between reality and representation um uh, second of all there was this interest in in, in sculpture 
in actual things happening and how somehow photography is like an imprint of the real, of the space. So there's uh, when I really found myself uh, and everything started working. But I didn't uh, start doing um, photography because I wasn't really happy still. I was trying to find myself. And I started with video. And I'm going to put some, some videos. They're very short. Sorry for explaining this, but this is milk and, and the crack is her. Here's another one. I'm going to speak while you see this one. Um, so video for me, it was awesome because I didn't know the media and, and that allowed me to relate in a very simple way, just trying to be as minimal as possible, like something that you cannot reduce anymore. And, and it set up a, a path to relate with photography and reality. And, and also, what I was uh, enjoying about this work is that even though they, they're very small, uh, I like the text in the video because somehow text has this authority and makes you see something. Like, once you see line, that's what you see. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, the visuals betray the text. And somehow, this authority breaks. And then you relate again with things and, and with materiality and with you knowing that the line is something, it's water. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of levels like these videos can be, can be enjoyed. And, and that, that was what uh, reconciled me with photography. And, and I started working with, again, with photographs. And at this moment, I knew how to use a 4x5 camera. That was my, my, the way I was doing my work. And I wanted, I didn't want to leave my craft. Somehow, probably it made me feel safe. Though I set up some rules that make me like just concentrate on what I wanted to tell. Like not overdoing the lighting or not overdoing anything. All, all the thing that I, that I said to myself is like, I'm gonna work where I live, no matter if I don't like the way it looks. Because if I start doing production or something, it just didn't feel like, um, uh, exactly, authentic, and and so this was a uh, um, uh, uh, sofa in the, the sublet I was living in, and it had this uh, hole in it. Uh, this is called uh, Doubting Saint Thomas. This this photograph, and this was for my first show, my first solo show here in, in New York, and I like this subject matter because uh, Doubting Saint Thomas is a uh, is this Bible by the. Uh, Biblical, Bible? biblical, sorry, biblical passage where uh, Christ uh, resurrected gets you know there with the apostles like Saint Thomas and uh, like he didn't believe 
so he made him uh, put his fingers in his body. And photography always prevents this, the bodiness or the thickness of the things. Uh, so once again, we are confronted with, we have to trust. And I was liking that I was doing this work while I was, uh, um, when Photoshop already existed. So it was kind of like a um, renewing this contract between the public and the, the, the author. Uh, you have to believe me. Um, and, and another thing that I was, this is called milk. Another thing that I was enjoying is that with all these very real things, uh, space can be explored and reimagined and, and think about again. So what I did for this one is just put a milk uh, on the sink and it disappeared, the, the, the whole, the, you know. And you can tell like where the porcelain starts and where is milk. And it was a beautiful actually experience. Uh, sometimes I thought like, oh, I should bring people here like, <laughs> to see it. And, but I have photography. And, and the, that was another way to take, take, take things to people. <laughs> and um, another thing that happened to me while I was doing this is that I have some friends that they were doing sculpture and they say like, okay, Mauricio, you, you, you're a sculptor. Like, you just don't want to admit it. It's like, why don't you bring these things to the gallery? It's like, I don't know. I, I was uh, photography shy, I guess. <laughs> like, I didn't want, I, it didn't feel natural uh, to bring things that were, you know, happening in my head and, and within this space and so sort of, like take it to the gallery at that moment. And I think that's another thing that photography has. Like we somehow cannot get rid of reality altogether. It's, uh, it's uh, something that it's always there. Like, uh, it's like, a, uh, it, it haunts us. It, like, make me think of uh, this famous image, icon icon um, iconic image of the soldiers putting the flag in I Iwo Jima. And in order to make the sculptures, they call the guys, the guys of the photograph, to make the sculptures, which doesn't make any sense, like, from the sculptural point of view. It does make sense from, from, from the photographic point of view. Um, but it took long for me to, to jump from one side to the other. This is called hot water. And I was really comfortable with the way I was exploring the camera, the setting, the space. Uh, for example, this one was because you, know, you cannot see because of the camera. Somehow the, the space reduced to a flat surface, or if you see it in a uh, exhibited. And the other thing is that the question about reality uh, helped me to um, to see how fictional photography was, even when you are trying to be as real as possible. And I didn't bring my work in chronologically. Uh, I, I made it more uh, thematically because I just noticed that there were certain uh, lines that I was exploring. This one is um, it's a sculpture, of course, <laughs> out of breath. And when I, was, when I did this, uh, I kind of solved a problem that was in my mind. Like, I always think that we artists uh, uh, come up with solutions for problems that don't exist. And this was, was like, <laughs> how, 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 do we do, how do I explain people that I'm amazed that the breath comes, you know, it's a hole, but it comes in pieces. So it doesn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> like how do you explain that? Like, and the way I solved it was like, okay, what if I just put space in between? And that way, somehow, I realized that, uh, that, um, that a space can actually nurture our space, or so, uh, nurture our view of things. This is actually called the space in between. And I just cut it, uh, you know, as many as possible before it just collapses. And um, I, what I like about this is like, even though there's no material of the chair, the chair continues. This is called two steps. 
and it's the negative space uh, that happened, you know, in between two steps. Uh, I wasn't all what I was saying now uh, is after afterthought. Like I wasn't very aware of what I was doing. Uh, I was mostly enjoying uh, every idea that I was having. Like for some reason, it ma it made sense, and I just executed. Like this is called uh, 270 degrees. This one is um, I was throwing, you know, like a, a sheet, um, a blanket. And it's the embodiment of uh, air, like it's sort of like a bubble or the skin of, of air. Um, two things that, that um, when, when I did, you know, I have a body of work and people were asking me, some people asked me like, what about this real in your work? And I hated that, <laughs> I hated it. This real, the, like why? Why do you do all these real things? And probably I don't like it because I, I don't like Dali, and it's just too spectacular for me. But I, I accepted the the, um, the question when when I said probably yeah, uh, surreal as in Magritte, like this is not a pipe kind of thing. Like what you see is not exactly what is happening. Uh, uh, but the other thing is was uh, about the uh, sense of humor, which my work has this uh, sense of humor. The funny thing is that I didn't see it <laughs> that way. You, it wasn't, I wasn't laughing, but a, lo a lot of times that I, when I was showing my work, people laugh, and, and I, I enjoy it. Um, but I think what happens is that my work it's, works like, like a joke in a way that you have the reality or you have you know, a line and it, all of a sudden something breaks, something is not the way it used to be, and that's what's happening. Um, but mostly it's because I think uh, what I was seeing is like the uh, world surrounding me or my house surrounding me and the things like a narrative, and I, I was just juggling the narrative, I was just making things different. In this case I just want to make a three-dimensional space out of a two-dimensional thing, and, and in other that space. Um, oh, sorry, this is, once again, this is uh, called Big Fish, and I just put one, one you know, like, uh, one page and the other, and it blended in, and it felt like a one thing. <laughs> this is, I, g I can give you an insight on my <laughs> th thinking process. <laughs> Well, first, uh, a lot of the ideas that I, I get is like by doing nothing. <laughs> um, in this case, whenever I saw the towel rack, or I don't know how, how to call that, the towel rack, without the towel and the uh, toilet paper, I thought there was, a, there, there was a misbalanced somehow. Like there was too much, there was a plus and, and, and a minus. And this was my way to solve that equation like uh, that gave me like <laughs> I feel relieved um, this one I mean I just love the way these circles are on top and they're not they're like a tension because they're missing something below and and I think a lot of things w a lot of times when I see things I did this and I'm going to show you how my thinking see this which is more like this. I mean, th I did this in Photoshop just to show, show you. So when I see that, it was for me like a cylinder already. And, and that's what I wanted to photograph. And if you think about this, it's not different from the breath, which in a way, I'm just extending the space. So in this case, the, the space was extended already. Uh, and I think there's a part of my brain or the artist's brain that communicate by itself and solve problems and they just throw the solution to you and for some reason you have to do these silly things with your camera and show it to, to everybody until it makes sense. Um, then I, I decided to take the risk and do some installations like trying to um, see what happens if I leave my home and bring this to the, to the gallery space. 
And I did this installation for my second show in uh, New York, and it's called Tunnel. So when you uh, get up the, and enter the gallery, you see these mirrors like scatter in the gallery space. And at the end, there's a room where if you stand, you see the, them lining, and you are able to see the, the sky from, from the farthest room in the gallery. So in a way, it's also this space that doesn't exist, this line that actually is not a line. But if you stand somewhere, it's a line. And once again, I think it has to do with the circles, on the, the snow circles and the, um, the um, stacking of the bread. And in a way, it's like the poet say, says that they write the same poem, poem every, every time. I think there's something that every creative mind, it's always going <laughs> to the same place. We just can't help it. And we just try to probably to see it again with the new eyes. And these are uh, um, called uh, breathing. These were some bags that were connected uh, to these tubes and at the end, you know, like to the, to the outside of the gallery. So then um, there are air outside, it was uh, heavier. And then inside, it was this, um, they inflated. And but the beautiful thing about this is that uh, is that when every where where every when every where no, yeah sorry when when the wind blow blew uh, you see the backs uh, inflating and deinflating and in a way this was the same show with the tunnel with the uh, with the mirrors that I showed you and I was trying to connect the inside with the outside sort of like bringing something from outside and making it happen inside like with the with the mirrors um, and i did this image as well within that time and i, w I was just uh, when i see my own work from far sorry i i noticed that there were a lot of connections in different uh, different series that i was doing so somehow this this relate for me with the, bo uh, the backs that are, that are inside of the gallery. And I didn't, while I was working, I, I was trying not to censor myself, uh, to try to explore as much as possible. And one thing about photography is that has this, uh, is this um, surrogate for memory, or actually sometimes it replaces memory. And there's a lot of my photographs that relates with this idea of, of uh, memory. In this case, what I did is all the things that came in this kind of uh, transparent paper and I bought in the supermarket, I just put it out and leave the still life. So it's a, it's a photograph of the memory of, of a memory. This is a uh, memory from my former apartment. So what I did is uh, I had an apartment. I was living in an apartment that had a very beautiful sun coming through the window every day. And I knew I was lucky. <laughs> and not always, you, 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 don't, you don't always gonna have that. And I knew I was gonna have to move because that was my, my way of living in New York my first years. So what I did is I drew the lines and I kept it and the next, the next apartment I was living in, uh, I just put that memory uh, like <laughs> there. This is um, the memory. Uh, what I did is I did this jelly and uh, with a refrigerator linen. So the whole thing was actually like this. So it's the memory of the space that was encasing this. And other things that I didn't, I mean, I didn't want to do like a um, recording of my everyday life, though it was something that was surrounding me. It, I didn't want to make this as uh, uh, autobiographical, though it became autobiographical. Like sometimes when I see a photograph, like I feel like nostalgic, like, oh, I remember that apartment. <laughs> I remember how I was feeling. Um, 
And sometimes I don't know how this psychologically works in every work. For this one, uh, I wanted something that was um, the interdependence, uh, bring you to this um, place where the little guy on top of that is depending on all of them and it's somehow like on the top. Because I tried at the beginning like the other way and it didn't feel like right. It just felt right when I, when I did that. And I don't know how that represents my, my state of being, but I'm sure it did. This is a pillow from all my friends at that time. So like a totem or like a column and, and the strength. So for me, these are like a happy images in a way that there's this togetherness and, and collective uh, effort so to speak. That one is called Empty. You see, people laugh at my work. <laughs> <laughs> and I put this again because um, I like, uh, for my images, I like them, uh, I like them better when they don't they don't mean anything. Uh, when I cannot explain and ta time passes and I'm not really sure what to tell about the image, like there's something new. Um, but sometimes images mean something even though I don't want to mean, I don't want them to mean anything. This one, for example, uh, it has this component like I didn't want to make a statement on uh, awakeness and dreaming and the bed being a portal to this other world. Not at all. I just use the bed because it make it easier to put this edge around the mirror and somehow it was my uh, Robert Smithson, no, sorry it's uh, yeah like um, no it's um, I don't remember the, the artist like the one who does the holes on uh, no 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 holes sorry uh, no, <laughs> uh, now I'm gonna. Uh, this is an example. Uh, it's uh, Robert Smithson. Yeah, Robert Smithson. Like holes on on the architecture, like in the, on, the, on the buildings. So that was kind of like uh, my cheap version uh, of that. Um, uh, Mata, Mata Clark. Mata Clark. Mata Clark. Yeah, Gordon Mata Clark. Yeah. Uh, sí, exactamente. Sí, no, pero Gordon Mata Clark. This is called uh, banana cosmic. I, 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 don't have <laughs> I don't have to explain any f further. This is also about you know my experience of traveling from Mexico to to U.S. It was a very intense time when I was traveling, and and also uh, you you feel displaced. You feel you have this feeling of uh, not knowing uh, where you are re really. And, and how places really uh, affect your identity or your idea of who you are. This is called True. And you cannot read the, the text because light is coming through, which I think was a paradoxical thing, like light supposed to enlighten things and make it easier and clear. And for this one, makes it the other way around. That's called Horizon. <laughs> so you see, I, I didn't censorship myself. <laughs> um, okay, and there's another thing about my work that I really enjoy. I, I, li I like physics, and 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 there's a lot of my work that uh, there's uh, this thing about forces. So this video, which is a recent one, is called um, uh, Sisyphus Dream. I'm gonna put it just to, and then I, I can explain. So, the the thing about that video uh, and Sisyphus, Sisyphus is this Greek uh, um, uh, god that he has the task to, you know, push this boulder onto the top, and the boulder will follow and he has to do this uh, for eternity. 
and and I think it's like the metaphor for humanity trying to arrange chaos, but chaos is always going to win. Uh, so a lot of my work, it's this moment of happiness when things look like they are just in the right moment, uh, but everything is going to fall. And, and, and that video is just by, by the loop, we can live in this illusion that somehow we're winning, <laughs> but we're not. <laughs> And in all my videos, uh, the solution is always something either break or stop working. Uh, but photography, by, by its stillness, stillness it makes us believe that there's that moment of happiness or that moment of uh, uh, wholeness. This, for example, is uh, helium on top, and the other I just blew it. And it was like, I don't know if you have, you know, like you buy a balloon, and uh, after two or three days, it's floating by itself, and it's so beautiful. It's like another <laughs> inhabitant. So this is like a um, scale, but vertical. This is called cosmic alignment. And if you see here, for example, you can see the like an, the eclipse, because it's actually aligned with the, with the sun. And it's a way to relate the inner space, this space, the personal space, to, this, to that other one, which is the huge space that sometimes we think we're not related just because it's huge and, and it's enormous, but we are part of the same. So it's a very uh, ordinary way to remember that we are all in this universe, <laughs> even with, uh, you know, like basketballs and whatever we have. I think this, this for example, like the one with the pins, the, the clamps, it's kind of the same. Like if you put, you move any of those, like the one on top, every, er, all of them are going to fall, fall because none, none, uh, everything depends on the, each other. For example, this one helps me to explain like how, uh, how, how I am a photographer <laughs> and, and in a very clear way. Like when I was doing this photograph, uh, at the beginning I set the, set the camera like the, at the level of the um, table. So you can imagine at the level of the table, there was just a line and the pencil. Uh, but I felt like it didn't express the, um, um, tension and I just raised the camera and then this triangle happened like that and then all of a sudden all these triangles start working and the little triangle that meets the other in the center may, made a lot of a lot more sense and then I, I did the photograph uh, and, and that was a moment when the image uh, matched the, the feeling that I was having um, because what I, the way I do things is that I put the thing first and then I photograph uh, later, like I put the camera. It's not, it's not that I put the camera and then start setting, setting up in front of the camera. Uh, so I try to relate with the thing and as much as possible try to translate into the image, which I don't know what it is. It just sometimes makes sense, and so sometimes it doesn't make sense. For example, the one with the tape, at the beginning, for, by the way I was putting it, uh, let me see, the, you know, the, uh, sorry, the, the masking tape that was like this. At the beginning, it was, uh, how do you call when it's the, yeah. No yeah, exactly, no, no tens, like, and I felt like that wasn't the thing I was, go I was going for, though I didn't know what I was going for. It's like when you meet your friends' parents, you say like, they don't look like your parents. <laughs> but you don't have an, a clear idea uh, who, who, who they should be. Um, so it's a very um, interesting interplay you know, or interesting relationship with uh, setting up and photographing and coming coming up or knowing what what is working and what is not working. That gave me a chance to 
work again with, with, other vi with video again. And this time, I just wanted to bring some of the experiences to video. So it's called container, but I like the, it's containing the, the energy. I always have to say that this is not, not autobiographical at all. <laughs> so th this is, of course, not buttery. I just bring it to the, the handle. So I was happy because at the beginning I had to do these videos that uh, they were very clean and white and then that allowed me to go to a different place and start like uh, exploring different a areas and places. So I like the world in the world. The thing is that New Yorkers are aloof, they don't want to... <laughs> if this were Mexico... <laughs> you, exactly, you, you forget about your globe. <laughs> it will be gone. It's only, only kids pointed out. I, mean, I have to say that kids like my work. And, and that's something that I like. This is a, a, not an installation that I do. I mean, I, of course it's repetitive, but it's like an interpretation and it's like making something do what they're not supposed to do. And I like that that um, fan is like a human So um, these images are when I was about to move out of New York, and then I start paying attention to surfaces and trying also to go back to understanding uh, photography in a different way. Um, and that made me to go back to the studio and try to um, minimize or to use as the, the least of possible uh, things to explore forces and explore, explore materials and also to start talking about uh, the studio itself like this is a video um, this set of videos I'm, I was working with the remain of energy this is like a marble ball like this size
one thing that it's beautiful is that the bigger the mass, the more energy it store, stores or storage. So it takes a long time for to, to it for settle, like there was something other forces making doing. This is another video. It almost looked like a render of it, but that one. One thing that I have to say is that uh, while I was living in New York, I um, started working doing editorial photography as well. And I think I, there was something about the language of commercial photography that uh, can speak uh, to a broader audience. And, it's, uh, and I also like the problematic uh, relationship with the, between art and commercial image, imagery. And what I'm doing here is like bringing both together and uh, trying to explore this other language in other place in this other place. And these are almost like photographs where something happened, like a lot of my work is, is that way. This is a photograph, this is not a video. <laughs> uh, this, is this one is called containing and it's a uh, plaster and how, you know, this thing fails to contain the thing. And, and, and I like the, how the substance lives outside and inside, like. In a way, it's a ca catalog uh, of uh, happenstances for me. And I like that they stand right in between of a, uh, there's, no, there's no narrative to it, uh, but yet there is something that it seems to be telling you.
what I am doing in this series of work is trying to work in a very controlled space. It, which, is, which is funny is that at the beginning I was trying to get rid of a uh, control or, or this um, trying to broaden. And for some reason I went back to this other very controlled space trying to um, uh, make the, uh, the most out of it. Uh, and trying to find another ways to explore objects by themselves. And this is, this is the, the latest show that I have. Where? That was in Guadalajara. It's a gallery called Curro. Mm -hmm. So I was show, showing video and also these photographs. <coughs> and that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you tend to observe these things first and then recreate them artistically, or are you dreaming them up? Um, most of the time, it's, it's, um, it just happens in, in, my, in my head. And, and honestly, sometimes I have a problem. Like, uh, I'm working with cubes, for example, like the last, the last thing. And things that I see or things that I imagine make sense. Or, for example, the chair with the cuttings. Um, I remember I was uh, sitting in a restaurant and there was this chair that broke and somehow, somehow the break kept the same line, like it was actually so something I saw. Yeah. And, and if I photographed that, it wouldn't have made sense. Uh, then I think like, how can I share this with someone else that makes so much sense to me? So it's a mixture of, of things, but I think it's a, it's a, um, sometimes I write things like something that is small and fits in a very small place. I don't know what that means, but all of a sudden there's something that actually makes sense to that, like, oh, this solves the problem. This, this actually fills, me, fills uh, that void that I was having, and then I, I, I do it, yeah. Uh, I've known your work for a while, and I'm really impressed with the palette. Like, I really love it. Like, the first work I saw of yours were the, the steam pictures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the domesticity and the palette are just, like, so poetic. There's something um, I didn't notice that there was um, uh, continuity with colors. And actually, the prints have more of this because the colors here looks more brilliant, like more saturated. Um, but I, one thing is that I didn't notice, and, and, and I was asked over and over, like, what about the lighting, and what about, like, and I didn't pay much attention. But after a while, uh, I became uh, influenced by myself, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I, I wasn't noticing, and, and I think that's the, the result. Like. <laughs> There's a lot of humor in your work. Um, and I wonder, yeah. do you set out to create the humor? Or is the humor kind of a byproduct of just what you do? It's a byproduct. The first time that someone asked me, like, what about the humor in your world? Like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm that serious. <laughs> 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 but I have to admit it, like, it was funny. <laughs> it was like, it was funny. Uh, and, and I think I matured that, like, okay, not overdoing it, like just when it happens, it has to, when, when it happens, it happens, and that's it, yeah. So you were saying when you started the talk that at the beginning you didn't know what you were doing or what the references were, and you know, you didn't have the pressure of, of you know, people telling you, oh, this is so-and-so's, exactly. you know, quote and stuff. So I'm, I'm wondering, since I actually met you where you were, at school, <laughs> exactly. and to survive that experience, ha what happened after that? Well, that's that's a whole trip. Like then you, you know, like I was in a gallery before I came, but I didn't feel the the pressure. But somehow, when I came here, the school was very intense for me. It was even more stressful than actually having a show. I don't know why. It was just probably. <laughs> Uh, when I was, uh, all my, my school, you know, memories came back to me and I don't know, I was so afraid of teachers while I was showing and, and I was having reviews. Uh, 
Um, but it actually made me more professional because in real life, you have to deal with that. You have to produce. Sometimes you, you don't have time. Sometimes you are not in the mood, <laughs> but you have to do it. And, and the good thing is when you are able to put up a show that is good, and some shows are good, some show, shows are not as good as the other, and live with it. Uh, but school and having all this uh, experience make me put things in perspective and, and deal, uh, manage stress better. So that, that was a good thing, actually. <laughs> now I have to do things. <laughs> uh, Mauricio, you mentioned that uh, just at the very end of your presentation that you do editorial and commercial work. Can you give some examples of how your aesthetic translates into commercial assignments? Well, it depends. Like, um, for example, I was lucky enough to, um, to meet uh, Michael Reynolds, which is here. Uh, he's editor of Wallpaper. Uh, another magazine and uh, it depends on the magazine because um, some magazines give you a lot of freedom and respects exactly what you do and that it's a very a very place to, to be but um, more often than not you are under someone else's um, um, demands um, Wired Magazine, for example, is very designing and has a very strict uh, guidelines. And, um, and I like when I was able to do my own work and mix it with, uh, with the magazine. Um, and sometimes I learn how to just follow, follow guidelines. And, but, but not as a bad thing because photography is a very wide endeavor and it's part of uh, how we communicate. So it actually made me um, understand the variety of ways you can get into photography or you can interpret photography or you can actually hijack uh, some um, language, even if it's commercial or if it's uh, uh, documental, and use it for your own purposes. Hi, it's more like a comment, affirmation about your work than a question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's imp very impressive. You are not only a photographer, you are a sculptor. And you transform everything very creatively into something interesting. So I'm just amazed by how you are creative. <laughs> and uh, that's why kids, uh, adults too, we love because we usually adults don't think so creatively anymore. And then kids think because they are so... So congratulations oh, for your you. way of thinking. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm curious. I have to ask. OK. Uh, <laughs> Carlos has a question. I'll get to you, Carlos, I promise. <laughs> uh, going back to Mexico after being in the United States for, you said, how many years? Uh, 13 years, okay. yeah. What did that do for your aesthetic? Was, uh, it, was it you know, freeing it in, in some way? or It actually. Um, I think I started doing photographs in my apartment because I didn't have a studio. So in a way, there's this energy you have to channel somehow. And my every day became my studio, and that's how I interacted. And the funny thing is that I went back to Mexico, then I had a studio, and then this other work, work started happening. Um, while I was here, um, you know, New York is very expensive, you know, you know that. <laughs> so <laughs> when, I, when I came back, I was first able to produce more uh, and focus more on my artwork. And second of all, um, I was, um, I had a lot of more free time to, um, to relate with, other artists and also this relationship bet between young artists and uh, uh, more experienced artists and all this community, it's very enriching. It's very, uh, and it gives me, at least to me, gives me um, energy to keep going and, and creating. And sometimes in New York, for me, became isolating. You know, I was still doing my shows and being invited to Williamsburg to show stuff and it was exciting 
but sometimes it was just uh, exhausting. <laughs> and but I think it depends on everyone. Photographs. My question was, uh, I was just curious, what influence did you have? Did you rely on art history for any chance? Eh? Because some of the images that you show brought to my mind, at least, um, sort of. Um, I, I, funny, uh, I think my recent work is a little bit more, relates more with modernism in, in that way, more like 20s and 30s. Uh, but the, um, the photographs that I do in my apartment, I think uh, Fishley and Ways, for example, it, it was an, an influence. Um, Fishley and Ways. Um, there's also, um, oh God, I always forget his name. Um, I love uh, the Stump Friedman work as well. It like, has a lot of humor in it. Um, uh, there's another, I, I'm forgetting his name, which uses a lot of this material that he has you know, at, ha at handy. And, and when I start seeing this, I, I absorb them. Uh, I revisit those influences. Uh, and I, I recognize them later on, like when I saw my body of work, like, oh, of course, there's something that I learned from this and, and, and this and, and the other. Uh, but they were more recent artists, uh, not, not as, far, as far back as the 20s. Thank you so much, Mauricio. Thank great. You. great.